I'm going to call this business. Uh, I'm going to um, call this meeting in or order. It is our annual meeting for um, 2021. And this is an annual meeting, not a business meeting, but an annual meeting celebrating uh, actually not only survival, um, but our ability to thrive even in the time of pandemic. It has been a remarkable year. I'm gonna turn this over to Shelly, who are, is uh, our membership and outreach coordinator for a fo more formal greeting. Go ahead, Shelly. Hey, Linda, thank you so much. I wanna say howdy, howdy to everyone. Absolutely thrilled that you're able to make it. This is our 2021 Arizona Historical Society annual membership meeting. And we're thankful that you're here. We're thankful you made it through the past 18 months with us. And we're also thank you for your support. A crazy thing happened over the past year and a half. And that is AHS members really stepped it up. You folks have increased your support for us financially at a time where we needed it. So we are most grateful. Um, our theme today is all together now. And um, it seems appropriate that we use this all together now theme because we're emerging from the pandemic. We're finally opening up our museums that have been shuttered. We're also getting together for the first time for in-person meetings. Um, and the other thing that we like about this theme all together now is that it really speaks to our mission, which is to connect folks to, uh, through the power of Arizona history. And it also allows us to connect. So again, thank you for being here all together with us. Um, we're keeping it pretty simple today. We're gonna have on the agenda, we're gonna start out with a message from our president, Linda Whitaker. Then we're gonna go on to our, our election for the uh, officers and the state board. Then James Burns, our executive director is gonna pop in and give a report. And finally, we're gonna wrap things up with a featured presentation from Dr. Anthony Pratcher. He, his uh, topic is digging in the crates. Not only is this a fantastic title, he is one of us. Um, you're gonna learn a little bit about him, but he's a former AHS intern and researcher. So we're absolutely thrilled to, to be given a platform to one of our own. All righty. Um, a couple Zoom reminders. First of all, please use that chat box where you introduce yourself for comments and questions. Our friends, Rebecca, Robert, and Marilyn are monitoring that chat and they'll get back um, with you guys as needed. Also, uh, because of the number of participants we have, we encourage you to keep your video off and microphone on mute. Uh, for the best view, please click speaker view. Um, and a lot of you have been asking, yes, this uh, meeting will be recorded and will eventually be posted to the AHS website. Now, we're going to go ahead and get started. And uh, give me a minute here to share my screen. Okay. All right, Linda Whitaker, give me a nod if you can see that screen that says all together. I can hear you, everything. Perfect. Yes. All righty. So um, before we get going on the meeting part of it, we want to find out about you. If we were in a normal meeting in a, a meeting room or, or one of our auditoriums, we could chat and we're not able to do that. So we're going to have a little poll. Tan, can you please call up our first poll? And you notice that I did say first poll. This is going to be an interactive meeting. Um, we're going to be asking you to vote a couple of times. So we're just going to make sure that everyone's real comfortable with this polling feature. Sure, Shelly, here we go. Here's the first poll. Oh, my apologies. This worked when I tested it a few moments ago. A moment, please. Todd, it might be because the screen is shared at the moment. I think it, it, we tested it and it worked, but uh, Shelly, if you could just not share for a moment, let, let's try that. Okay. There's your poll. Can everyone see the poll? Yes. All right. 
we'll keep that open for just a few minutes here. So what we want to know is how long your family has lived in Arizona. And I, this is going to be really interesting because I know for a fact that we have someone here who's been around well over 100 years. So just take a couple minutes or a couple seconds and, and let us know. And Tan, I can't see the poll, so I'm going to let you read the results when it's ready. Well, Shelly, uh, I am unfortunately unable to see the poll at this point either. So, <laughs> Marilyn? And actually, nor can I. So it might be that the, the host is the one who can see it. And that might be Marilyn. I can, I can see it. I don't know how I'm the one that can see it, but I can. So you let me know when I can close it. Um, I just relaunched it. So if everybody wants to put their uh, poll numbers in again, we'll, we'll give it about 30 seconds and then I will end it and be able to share the results. Thank you, Rebecca. All righty, Rebecca, anytime you feel good, let's go ahead and close it out. Now I can't see it, so you tell me if you can. <laughs> we can see it, we can see Wonderful. it. So Linda, why don't you go ahead and tell us what that poll says? Thank you. Okay, uh, this is amazing because I really want to get to the last tier here. Zero to 10 years, 9% of those responding said zero to 10. Of those responding, 9% said 11 to 25. Of those responding, 35% said 26 to 50. Um, of those responding, 39% said 51 to 100 years. That's quite a spread, but the next one floors me. More than 150 years, 9%. <laughs> Someone can explain that to me, anybody. And this Bruce is Gwen. the time. Yeah. That's that. It's Bruce Gwynn. <laughs> All righty. So thank you, Lynn, for helping me out there. And what's interesting about this poll is it, it really does tell you a lot about our membership. We have folks that uh, don't live in Arizona or who are new to Arizona. They're just people that are passionate about Arizona history or about the state. And then we've got some people who've been around for a really, really long time. So we are grateful wherever you are um, in your journey with the Arizona Historical Society. We're absolutely thrilled um, that you're here. I'm going to once again go ahead and share my screen. We've got the poll. Okay, now, okay, perfect. All righty, so thank you. That was wonderful to learn about you. And it is now my pleasure to turn things over to Linda Whitaker, who is our president. Okay, um, my message is one of, um, I marvel, I actually marvel as, of what we were able to do in this pandemic year. And uh, when I look at what the board goals were for this past year, we exceeded all of them. And uh, we had planned for an influx of maybe two to six new board members. And for those of you who are not aware, we are now a governor appointed board, have been to, since 2013, but up until the last maybe 15 months or so, um, we had more, far more vacancies than we had board members. We have um, on this board, we are the, one of the smallest agencies in the state, and we have one of the largest boards, state boards um, in the state, which makes it um, very interesting, very challenging. And uh, we had hoped for, planned for two to six new members. In point of fact, we had 14 new appointments to this board, 12 of whom are currently serving. And that our board, our composition of this board is remarkable on many, many fronts. It is the most diverse that we have ever had. Um, it 
We have the youngest woman to ever serve. We have the youngest man to ever serve. We have a member of um, um, one of the Native American tribes. We have um, uh, a marvelous black woman from um, Douglas um, who serves on our executive committee. And we have representation from all over the state um, covering um, a wide variety of backgrounds, ages, and um, this, if I were to point to one reason why we were reaccredited for all four locations, we had never attempted that before. And in point of fact, um, AAM had never accredited anyone uh, during this pandemic. And we were the first ones to say, they wondered if we were willing to give it a try virtually. And we said, yes, we're gonna give it a try. And um, I have to tell you, uh, we came through with flying colors. One of the things they pointed to was the board. And we spent a fair amount of time in interviews regarding board, board function, board activity, um, orientation, um, and other kinds of, of things. They cross-examined us on the board more than once. And they could not believe that a governor appointed board could not only survive, but thrive and, um, and function apolitically. And, we, and so it seems uh, that uh, we may become a model for um, other boards to follow. And um, I'm, I'm spending time on this because it came as a surprise to me that they would focus on this and point to it as one of the reasons for accreditation. That is no small achievement. Um, the things that I, and, and uh, my message is posted on the web, but um, the, I am proud of a lot of things we did this year. Um, I'm pr very proud of some very difficult and bold moves that the board made to made us at the end of the year actually sustainable. We had, and I'm all credit to our um, treasurer, Jim Snitzer, who has the ability to put almost everything um, in one page and to make our finances understandable. But because of how he framed the budget and because of his 30,000 foot view, we were running through our reserves at nearly $667,000 a month. And I thought I would have to face you today to say we have to close. We are at the end of our reserves. But we took enough measures without laying off any staff, we have that down to $5,000 a month. Part of that um, is not filling uh, vacancies um, on the staff, which takes a lot of fortitude on behalf of the staff. But I want you to think about that for a minute. Um, when almost 30% of um, cultural institutions, um, uh, museums have closed, not planning to reopen anytime soon. We didn't have to, and we won't for the foreseeable future. Um, a thing also that is remarkable to me because of the able work of Eric Gonzalez, he somehow um, unlocked the key to uh, the state capital improvement plan and was able to leverage over a million dollars in deferred maintenance. Let me repeat this. If you've had to live with a deferred maintenance list that doesn't only seems to grow with time, never seems to shrink, this is a man who actually made a dent in our deferred maintenance, uh, probably for the first time ever. Um, due to staff, work, we applied for and received over $900,000 of 
uh, relief funding due to COVID. We also made a bold decision, um, even though we got a windfall donation in this past year, but we made the bold decision to invest it um, towards the infrastructure um, and the foundations for a capital can, uh, campaign. This includes a feasibility study and a comprehensive gift uh, policy, but what it does for the very first time ever is set us up for a very ambitious, maybe not even just statewide. We have people who um, are interested in us nationwide in terms of a capital campaign, very ambitious, and um, also led by very, um, very bright people. Um, the, I mean, uh, the other thing um, is that uh, we did a 180 degree turn and uh, diverted routine tasks to online communications. We have reached more people, more places statewide um, state officials, organizations, members, and the general public than we have ever, ever done before. And this is a very, very interesting lesson in terms of where we need to invest in the future. Um, lastly, and I think Shelley alluded to this, and it is remarkable, it is absolutely remarkable, is that our AHS membership um, which had a steady decrease over time has really leveled off. We've actually got new members and the financial support of our members increased this past year, 7%. This is at a time when those museum closures statewide, nationally is because their membership shrunk and that financial support shrunk with it. We didn't, we didn't. So we must be doing something right. Um, I'm going to pause here for a moment and Marilyn, um, I'm going to just pause a minute, um, then you can bring up the next, um, uh, the next slide. Um, I want to pause a moment to talk about the Al Merito, Merito Award for 2021. We live in exceptional times and we have an opportunity to preserve the continuity of this award despite the COVID year. We actually, um, just in conversation with staff, thought that we would give it a bye this year. But we have an opportunity to waive an exemption and to recognize one of our own. So Tom Foster, where are you, Tomas? Tom Foster, you are going to be awarded our um, El Merito Award for this year, 2021. Usually board members are exempted. But we have an opportunity this year to make this a special um, exemption. And let me tell you the criteria for it, which incidentally, Tom exceeds. In order to qualify for this um, award, you have to have outstanding contributions or extraordinary efforts to interpret and disseminate Arizona history. You must have demonstrated enrichment of a community. You must serve as a role model for the preservation of Arizona history. Um, you must have served a number of years working in the field of Arizona history. I think he has tilled that field to the nth degree. Um, and uh, preservation of previously untold Arizona history or engagement with an underserved audience. And if anyone on this board uh, has reached out to rural, underserved, uh, very small um, historical um, societies and organizations, it is Tom Foster. So given fire, floods, the pandemic, keeping his own museum afloat, serving on the board and tires, tirelessly reaching out and advocating for small uh, museums in Eastern Arizona. Tom has quietly earned this honor many times over. Tom embodies enthusiastic public service, 
commitment to AHS mission and dedication to rural people and communities in Arizona. And Tom, over to you. Uh, I am absolutely <laughs> unbelievably left without comment. I, this is an absolute surprise and I, uh, <laughs> I humbly accept this. This is amazing. Thank you. Linda and board and all the members of AHS. This is amazing and uh, wow, what a, what a way to, uh, to end the week. Uh, I'm, just, I'm, I'm left really without comment. I, I appreciate this greatly. This is very, very kind. Uh, and uh, I, will, I will do everything in my power to uh, continue to live up to the uh, to all the things that you've enumerated here, Linda. Thank you very much. You've earned it, Tom. You have earned it. And I think you're a role model for, um, for, any, for all of us, just absolutely for all of us. Um, with that, I, I, I need uh, to, um, we need to, there's a point of business here. Um, I was so eager to get to Alamerto that I, Overlooked it. We need to approve the minutes from our 2020 um, annual membership meeting. It is all online. And um, what I would like to hear is um, a, it, it was fully recorded and posted. Um, okay, we're doing a poll. All right. So people, um, could we have a, just vote yes or no to approve these minutes? And anytime you want to, Tom, either now or later, just let me know if we have more yays than nays. You need a motion first, if that case uh, I No, move. we're just doing a, uh, because of oh. board members, I mean, uh, our, our okay. membership is also voting. Okay, okay. Okay, we have, uh, it seems that the voting has uh, slowed down here, Linda. Um, if anyone else wants to vote yay or nay on the approval of the minutes, please do so now. I'm going to end the poll. The annual 2020 annual meeting minutes has been approved unanimously. Um, that poll is complete. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And now um, uh, we're going to turn this over to my fine colleague, uh, from Yuma, Bruce Gwynn. I appreciate that wonderful introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to present the slate for the officers for the 2021-2022 year. And that would be for president, Linda Whitaker, for vice president, Eileen Snoddy, for secretary, Bruce Gwynn, and for treasurer, Jim Snitzer. Okay, um, I am going to uh, launch the poll here in a moment. Just a reminder um, to our participants, um, only members who are in good standing may vote. It is one vote per household. Um, and this is a simple yes or no vote. You are approving the entire slate of officers. You must be on uh, video in order to see the poll. So I'm going to leave it open here for um, until it looks like we've, we've got all the votes are in. Um, and just to assure you, we will validate that everyone who voted was eligible to vote after the fact. And we will include that information in the minutes uh, when those are posted. So with that, I'm going to launch the poll. And you are approving the slate of officers, yes or no. It yeah, looks like, okay, I'm gonna leave it for just another couple of seconds. It looks like the voting has slowed down. I'm going to end the poll. And uh, the result was unanimous um, that uh, to approve the slate of officers as presented. I'm sharing the results right now. 
And again, we will verify that everyone who was eligible to vote, um, that, that everyone who voted was eligible to vote after the fact, but it, it was unanimous. Thank you, Bruce. You're welcome. All righty, Bruce and Tan, thank you so much for uh, handling our officer election. At this point, we're gonna move on to the next part of our agenda. We are delighted to hear from Dr. James Burns, who is the executive director here at the Arizona Historical Society. James. Thanks very, thanks very much, Shelley. I appreciate that introduction. And uh, my presentation is really gonna focus on the extraordinary accomplishment that was achieved this past year of full accreditation statewide by the American Alliance of Museums, um, which is a, a first for us statewide. When I had the honor of being invited to lead this organization three and a half years ago, I was handed a number of really big goals, including get us reaccredited make sure we get through a sunset review successfully that's coming up, unite the organization and focus on fundraising through friends. Uh, it turns out that uh, some of those goals were more easily achievable than others. Um, our focus really became a reaccreditation and, and I'll explain why that has really set the table nicely uh, going forward to achieve our other goals. The path to reaccreditation we knew um, revolved around unifying the organization, um, our education efforts, and bringing more inclusion into the institution. It was a three-year journey, and all of the work that we have done together, all stakeholders, staff, boards, members, since 2018 has been focused on attaining that reaccreditation. So why seek it? Why do we care? because it really increases credibility and value with funders, policymakers, local communities, and peer organizations. It signals that the organization is achieving its stated mission and goals. It indicates the organization's performance is meeting standards and best practices as generally understood within the museum field at large. And it's a mark of distinction that only about 3% of all museums in the United States have attained. Also, it really prepares us and positions us well for a successful sunset review coming up in 2023 and for launching a capital campaign. So what was the result? Well, most of you know by now, the first statewide AAM accreditation for AHS. AHS was first accredited in 1999 and re-accredited in, re in 2006, but both times, the distinction was granted only to our flagship facility in Tucson, the Arizona History Museum. Now we have accreditation for the Arizona Heritage Center, the Arizona History Museum, the Pioneer Museum, and the Sanguinetti House Museum and Gardens. What were some of the stakeholder reactions? My favorite, I've shown a few of my favorites here. Governor Ducey tweeted, huge achievement. The Arizona Historical Society has received full national accreditation, an accomplishment only 3% of active museums have reached. Congratulations. And Laura Lott, the CEO of AAM, what a great story. She's referencing a story that was printed about our achievement in the Tucson Sentinel. Thank you for bringing this to my attention and just in time for our board meeting this week. I'll definitely share with the board and the AAM team as an example of the power of accreditation, as well as how savvy directors can use the process to advance relevance, culture change, and equity work in their institutions. We're only going to make that connection stronger in the coming years. And congratulations to you again. Following the harrowing past 16 plus months, it's truly heartwarming and inspiring to hear about all that you're doing at AHS. Kudos, I'm in awe and I cannot wait to visit. And finally, Coral Evans, Northern Office Director for the Office of U.S. Senator Mark Kelly. Quote, I saw this on Facebook and I seriously jumped out of my chair in joy. Awesome job. This is amazing and well-deserved. I'm so happy for AHS, um, as am I. So what did the AAM staff and the peer reviewers cite as exemplary? 
actually our core documents, our new mission and vision statements, our collections management policy, not terribly exciting, but our emergency and disaster preparedness plan, our code of ethics and our strategic plan, our demonstrated ability to adapt our collecting, preservation, interpretation, and dissemination activities to the shifting needs of the audiences that AHS serves. As Linda's already pointed out, the board appointment process was called, quote, the best we've ever seen for a museum system that is a state agency. Our beloved Journal of Arizona History, of course, diverse exhibitions and public programs that reflect the demographics of the communities that AHS serves across Arizona. Our resiliency in a pandemic and a recession um, by utilizing multiple approaches to nearly erase the organization's burn rate to avoid permanent closure and swiftly refocusing on audience engagement and growth through robust virtual programming. Our efforts to share previously untold and hidden Arizona history. Also our plans to collect and interpret contemporary history. They specifically cited the Marked by COVID exhibition that was at the Arizona Heritage Center in Tempe and the Journal of the Plague Gear Collecting Project as well that we're working on with ASU. Also, as Shelley and Linda have both noted, but I have to underscore this again, they were so impressed by our membership engagement. The fact that we maintained and slightly increased the membership of AHS during the pandemic, while many museums saw 25 to 45% decreases is nothing short of remarkable. And that increase in membership revenue that Linda mentioned, 7%, that's due to all of you who significantly raised your giving level in a time of great need. And for that, I thank and I applaud each and every one of you. Uh, meetings were cited with stakeholder groups across Arizona, which quote, clearly demonstrated that AHS is filling a vital need and playing an essential role in the communities it serves through fulfillment of its mission. They met with 26 different groups of stakeholders over a period of a week. And in particular, they cited some very meaningful conversations with representatives from the Sosa Carrillo House in Tucson and folks who were involved with Flagstaff's Resilient Women exhibition. Additionally, AHS has demonstrated ability to change and to remain relevant to contemporary audiences and our commitment to diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. As I wrap up, please bear with me. It's worth reflecting on a paragraph written by the AAM Accreditation Commission. Please note that these are not the reviewers who actually came and visited with us for a week. These are, this is a very astute and accomplished panel of national peers who took everything that they heard about the organization and said, quote, the society is to be commended for recognizing the need to change in order to remain relevant, methodically identifying weak areas and with incredible skill working to address them. The staff's efforts to, to shift the organization's culture and make hard and bold choices and decisions, excuse me, ensure AHS remains well positioned for the future. We applaud the board and state's strong support of these efforts, especially in the face of constituent pressure to maintain the status quo. We also commend the AHS's commitment to diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion, and the work done to ensure diversity is reflected in its exhibits, programs, and staff. DEAI is an area the Accreditation Commission we'll be giving even closer attention to at the time of all accredited museums next reviews to ensure they maintain the organizational culture and structures to practice and advance DEAI as part of ongoing operations. I thank all of you for your continued support in our efforts to modernize the organization. Also a note from one of our actual accreditation reviewers Tim Chester, 
who said, I'm extending my congratulations upon learning of your well-deserved decision of reaccreditation from the AAM Accreditation Commission. What we saw is a diverse team of talented people working collaboratively and very hard on a focused agenda of relevancy and growth for the Arizona Historical Society. It's a compliment to you all. And, and then one of my own observations is most of all, the AAM Accreditation Commission in its decision has unequivocally said the organization is on the right track. We appreciate all of your contributions to ensuring AHS's bright and thriving future. Thank you for the opportunity to meet with you today. All right, James, thanks so much for sharing uh, with the membership the, the great news of our accreditation. Next up, we're going to have Dr. David Turpey. He's going to be introducing our speaker. Thanks, Jelly. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, before I introduce our, our speaker, let me just remind everyone that this is being recorded and to please stay muted during the presentation. And if you have questions, please enter them in the, in the chat and we'll do our best to, to get to them uh, at the end. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anthony Pratcher II. Dr. Pratcher is a lecturer and honors faculty fellow at Barrett, the Honors College of Arizona State University. He earned a bachelor's degree in history from Howard University and a PhD in American history from the University of Pennsylvania. His scholarship uses oral interviews, census data, and archival collections, including from the Arizona Historical Society, to explore how urban policies influence community formation in the metropolitan Southwest. He also serves on the board for the George Washington Carver Museum and Cultural Center in Phoenix. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Pratcher share his talk, Digging in the Crates, the Role of Community Archives in Suburban History. Dr. Pratcher. Thank you, David. I very much appreciate that introduction. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Let me begin by sharing with you my screen. It says my screen sharing is being paused. Can you all see what it is that I have to share? No, it's not. It's not showing up on, on our end. It's just dark. Oh, there it goes. And there we go. There we go. All right. Um, I have written comments. So good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be able to share my research with you all today. Um, I've spent most of my adult life in the collections like those over at Papago Park seeking to understand the history of Central Arizona. So this journey has taken me farther than I ever could have imagined. My academic career has taken me from Glendale to Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Providence, Pittsburgh. But every summer, our local archival collections pulled me back home to brave the heat so I could keep digging in the crates, to use a colloquial term. I first encountered the story of Maryville Hospital in the Arizona room at Burton Bar Public Library. It was not until I found myself in the small archival collections at the Glendale Arizona Historical Society that I was really able to understand why the story mattered so much. There, I was gifted access to the personal records of Byron Peck, former mayor of Glendale and former administrator at Northwest Hospital, now known as Banner Thunderbird. He left his daughter, with paperwork that commemorated his family's uh, service at the hospital. Before, when I was thinking of the way that community hospitals operated in the West Valley in particular, this was merely a story of economic development. You know, you all will see 
as there was blood, sweat, tears, energy, passion, care, that Peck, his wife, his mother, and their close friends, they all poured into Northwest Hospital as unpaid volunteers. Once I saw that, I began to realize the story I was telling had far deeper social implications than economic development. What I'm attempting to describe is how the process of economic development within our community, what we see as social capital, the ties that bind communities together through voluntary mutual aid, it serves as an accelerant for local investment in the suburban Sunbelt, in the communities and the neighborhoods that we all live in. So moreover, I came to understand this through archival research. It's been by going through the personal records left in the attics, garages, and offices of suburban pioneers that I've been able to understand the transformation of the Salt River Valley in this way. So I'd argue that the billions in revenue created by suburban development is occurs because of how we, those of us who are living here, create community in our social lives. We can create better institutions if we understand the history of our community. So with that, let's begin. Peggy Schaefer did not work outside of her home until she joined the women's auxiliaries at Maryvale Samaritan Hospital. She was quickly promoted to a managerial position in the gift shops where her business acumen helped raise $35,000. Good Samaritan, the regional health care network that owned Maryvale Hospital would have needed around 15 full-time staff to replicate women auxiliaries labor at this institution. However, aside from a staff liaison, Good Samaritan paid none of the women's auxiliaries for their works. Volunteers had always been a part of the Maryville Hospital staff as community residents donated both time and money to establish healthcare facilities in the neighborhood. Their unwaged labor had proved essential to hospital operations over the years. When asked her thoughts on unwaged labor, Schaefer replied, people are always asking me if you do this job so well, then why don't you get a paying job? But I enjoy volunteering. I like helping people. While volunteer work pleased Schaefer, many of her colleagues felt that gender discrimination had limited their employment opportunities on wage labor and none received the institutional influence granted women's auxiliaries when Maryvale Hospital opened in 1961. So let's begin with the literature review. In the post-war period, women's auxiliaries represented the public interest at voluntary, also what we would call nonprofit hospitals. Rosemary Stevens, argues that these smaller hospitals represented the belief that change could be accomplished in the hospital system at the local level through good faith efforts of responsible citizens. She found that by 1960, more than 1 million women's auxiliaries staffed hospital wards, operated gift shops, or greeted patients, and that these volunteers, mostly teenagers and homemakers from nearby communities, developed, quote, fealty to their hospital, accentuating its individual identity and binding its ties to local networks, end quote. At the same time, though, there were new stakeholders in American healthcare, such as health insurers, hospital developers, or consumer advocates. These new stakeholders reduced the influence of women's auxiliaries at community hospitals. Due to the financial influence of commercial interests, they became afterthoughts for hospital administrators. While in contrast, bondholders, uh, a specific class that also blurs the line between a proprietary and charitable interest, they became better represented they became better positioned to represent the public in community healthcare. So in the United States, hospitals take one of three corporate forms, either public, proprietary, for-profit, or voluntary, which is nonprofit. While the healthcare industry has grappled with rising costs basically for the last century, volunteer networks helped bind community hospitals to charitable societies, and cities used property tax exemptions to subsidize these facilities as an alternative to public health care. Scholars have shown how community hospitals were central beneficiaries from post-war reforms in federal housing or federal hospital development policies. Scholars have focused on things such as the Hospital Survey Act and Construction Act of 1946, known as the Hill Burton Act, to understand how nonprofit health care drove post-war economic development. This seminal legislation, along with private insurance, minimized the development of proprietary hospitals in the post-war period. However, scholars such as Elizabeth Candy Shermer have also shown how Arizona was a forerunner in the use of municipal bonds for industrial development. Similarly, private investors purchased mortgage bonds to finance Arizona's community hospitals. So Maryville Hospital, and more succinctly, the experience of women's auxiliaries shows how proprietary interest could exploit volunteer labor to gain a foothold in our healthcare system. Now, healthcare, like most public necessities has historically been underfunded in Arizona. And while the territorial government did not develop adequate healthcare services for public use, voluntary societies emerged to help provide private communities with medical care. 
So St. Luke's, the oldest voluntary hospital in the Valley was founded on this basis when businessmen sponsored an Episcopalian cleric seeking quote, to heal the sick without regard to race, creed or station in life, end quote. I believe St. Luke's opens in 1908. It was sponsored and bankrolled by the publisher of the largest newspaper in the state. He was a trustee for the facility and his wife was a charter member on a women's auxiliaries entitled the Board of Visitors. Moreover, Josephine Williams Goldwater, mother to Barry Goldwater, she was also a member of the Board of Visitors. Their annual charity ball raised nearly 10% of the initial hospital endowment and moreover drove members to join the volunteer labor force. By the 1950s, St. Luke's Charity Ball was a civic institution that regularly raised more than $25,000 towards the capital campaign for the hospital. And in 1951, their president was elected chairman of the board for Phoenix Memorial Hospital. Now, suburbanization created new frontiers in community health care. Prior to this time, most of the voluntary hospitals in the Valley were located in central Phoenix. You have St. Joe's, St. Luke's, um, Good Samaritan, Phoenix General Hospital, they're all within Phoenix city limits. But West Valley residents, they would have to red head into Phoenix if they needed hospital care. By the 50s though, the Glendale Chamber saw a need for community health care as thousands of new homes were sprouting in the surrounding agricultural hinterland. According to records at the Glendale Arizona Historical Society, there have been previous attempts to develop a local hospital, but they had all failed due to quote, apathy and lack of cooperation on the part of doctors and most of the residents of Glendale. In 1957, Michael Wachner and Charles Crone, two hospital developers from Southern Arizona, advanced the Glendale Chamber 35,000 to five, five acres from Ruth Waite. However, the nonprofit hospital board, led by the wife of Glendale Chamber president, disbanded once they realized there would not be Hill Burton funds available for construction. Undeterred, Glendale Mayor Byron Peck joined with several leading businessmen to pursue a private alternative, interest-bearing bonds sold to local investors. Leaders in the Phoenix Chamber of Commerce loudly advocated for security regulators to allow Arizona banks to offer interest-bearing bonds on behalf of nonprofit corporations. Mortgage bonds forced community hospitals to prioritize proprietary aspects of their charitable mission and granted investors influence over hospital boards. These attractive investments with low default rates due to perpetual revenue would eventually burgeon into a half trillion dollar hospital construction financing bond market at the national level. But first, at the local level, Arizonans had to be convinced that hospital mortgage bonds were a worthy investment. Maricopa County proved surprisingly disinterested in the utility of these investments. Peck believed that the voluntary hospitals, quote, fear the competition from new hospitals and convinced local professionals that community hospitals were being led by, again, quote, a bunch of crooks. Peck asked Glendale medical doctors to get behind this effort and put it across as he said, lest we shut our eyes as we've done before and let someone else do it. And he pleaded with community residents to quote, dig into their funds to help with the hospital bond sales. Crone hired Gloria Hale to sell bonds while he set up the nonprofit corporation. And while donations from local corporations like First National Bank, APS and SRP helped raise enough funds to begin construction, this momentum waned as local investors saw financial turmoil at nearby community hospitals. So in 1960, Peck's wife, along with the wives of his colleague, helped form a women's auxiliaries at Northwest Hospital. A trained official from another hospital met to detail what procedures would be necessary to incorporate an auxiliary and how that organization would benefit Northwest Hospital. One of their primary purposes would to be to create good public relations and uh, community understanding between the hospital and the surrounding area. At the time, there were around $500,000 in outstanding mortgage bonds that needed to be sold. So when the auxiliary formed, their initial efforts, as noted in their bylaws, could be distilled down to buy a bond or sell one. Auxiliary re leaders recruited go-getters to circulate word among club women and published newspaper editorials exhorting community members to purchase bonds. They also helped with the bond sale thermometer that advertised how many bonds had been sold. They can, in conclusion, when the hospital was finally built. Um, it was said that full credit must be given to the women of the auxiliary during this time, excuse me, for without their untiring efforts, the hospital might possibly not have become a reality. So as the thermometer rose, more citizens showed their desire to purchase bonds, and which indicated, according to uh, the papers left at Glendale Arizona Historical Society, which indicated that the community had complete confidence in their leaders. Eventually, 
Northwest Hospital opens in September of 1960. So what Northwest Hospital does is prove that mortgage debt could provide a market-based solution to community health care. Maryvale, which is south of Glendale, wound up becoming much larger um, than the small town to the north of it when, when residents first moved there. Um, but when they first moved there, when people first moved to Maryville in 1955, 1956, the community was so underdeveloped that they couldn't even get access to telephone lines. So Gerald Daly, one of the first members of the Maryville Hospital Board, he recalled that John Long, the developer of Maryville, wanted to build parks and swimming pools and other things for the community, but they had not been forthcoming. So he said that if we incorporated as a community organization, that he would give us a community center. Maryville Social Clubs raised funds for myriad necessities in suburban life, like community centers or child care clinics, child care clinics, excuse me. So it came as no surprise when several community organizations joined forces on the Maryville Siesta Hospital Planning Board to create the Maryville Hospital. While public resources had not been forthcoming, John F. Long connected community leaders with private creditors who presented a similar deal as Glendale had received with Northwest Hospital. So mortgage debt, along with community effort, would develop health care in Maryville. Daly and his fellow directors followed Glendale's strategy to raise the capital necessary for hospital construction. Long highlighted development plans and promotional materials for Maryville, while newspapers ran human interest articles on construction progress. And most importantly, there were the advertisements for hospital mortgage bonds. For months, years, Arizonans were told your money can earn 100% or more through the purchase of bonds via mail at the construction site or at a Midtown Phoenix sales office. Moreover, the Maryville Women's Club created a social calendar around development as dances, variety hours, dinner plays, they were all organized to raise proceeds for hospital construction. These events entertained community residents and provided salesmen with opportunities to pitch interest-bearing bonds to the broader public. Maryville Hospital was promoted to the public by Hudson L. McGuire, a wartime naval officer married to a Hollywood starlet and California developer, Theodore Shostak. Their venture, Universal Development Company, had incorporated in Iowa, but won contracts to develop several community hospitals after Shostak became the, the president of Hospital Developers of Arizona. Their promotion was highlighted by claims that their salesmen could, so, could sell a half million dollars in mortgage bonds monthly. And this activity, it helped boost real estate development in the area. Uh, homeowners, they would act, advertise proximity to Maryville Hospital when selling neighborhood property, while builders leased nearby land to build medical centers. When the hospital finally opened, John F. Long crowed, it has been my pleasure to plan for the location well in advance of actual need and to make the land available to a responsible organization and to cooperate with them through construction. Hospital promoters also proved highly appreciative of the women's auxiliaries. McGuire recognized auxiliary leaders for their long and tireless service without thought of compensation, while Long thanked Maryville residents who, quote, wholeheartedly supported the hospital through bond purchases, fund drives, cake sales, and by their contributions in time to develop a fine facility brought about by community effort. John Long would later recall that in the early 60s, there was a severe recession, employment dropped, a lot of the people that moved here and then lost their jobs wherever they were working were no longer able to make, they couldn't make their payments and they moved out and the houses went to repossession, end quote. So similarly, community hospitals fell short of the promoted revenue projections and they struggled to meet their financial obligations. Peck had been a leading supporter of Northwest Hospital, but believed that the nonprofit board had been victimized after seeing contractors make changes to quote, suit themselves and promoters misrepresent hospital equipment quality. Money, drugs, and equipment disappear from the facility as hospital revenues struggle to break even. So to help, women's auxiliaries donated more than $15,000 in hospital equipment and convinced local women's clubs to donate furnishings for hospital bedrooms. At Northwest Hospital, the Peck family had risked their family standing, convincing their neighbors to invest. Financial bankruptcy at the hospital would threaten social bankruptcy for his family, I argue. Peck eventually left public office so he could administer Northwest Hospital, compelled by, quote, an obligation to make the hospital pay so that the good people of Glendale who had purchased bonds would not lose faith in me. And those who had worked so diligently to make it possible to have a hospital in Glendale would be rewarded for their efforts. His family story shows how women's auxiliaries towed this line between workers and investors. 
Now, a similar story can be told in Maryville. Women's auxiliaries raised several thousand dollars from rummage sale for hospital equipment after upper management failed to deliver promised materials before fleeing the city. But Maryville did not have a Byron Peck, an elected official with deep connections in the surrounding community. So community leaders resigned from the board and Maryville Hospital fell under the direction of an affiliated physician. At this time, Phoenix had become home to a gaggle of ambitious developers like David H. Murdoch, who later went on to become a billionaire CEO of Dole Food Company. And he leveraged at others as well, leveraged their success as builders into more complex business arrangements. So Murdoch, he's important to our story because he starts Union Title Company to finance his real estate developments. And by the early 60s, this firm had grown into one of the largest mortgage title companies in the state. Union Title served as a trustee at several community hospitals across Maricopa County and insisted that their boards, these nonprofit boards, seat representatives from Union Title to, quote, protect the interests of the bondholders. Community members had to fight mortgage trustees for control over hospital operations. In Scottsdale, Union Title sought control of a hospital board after it missed a payment to bondholders. A company executive was installed as chairman with plans to lease facilities to the Baptist Hospital Association of Arizona. Wachner and Crone, the friends of the Glendale Chamber, joined the Scottsdale Chamber in a suit to prevent Union Title from placing their representative on the board. Their representative's testimony de demonstrates how commercial interests could pervade the nonprofit nature of community health care. He said that he never read the bylaws of the nonprofit board and claimed that he had no idea how much the hospital paid union title and administrative fees, even though he led the division with their contract. It required strong leadership to prevent proprietary interests from taking advantage of stressful and chaotic situations, such as the distressing financial situation which community hospitals were finding themselves in. So there was a trade group sponsored by the voluntary hospitals that entered this vacuum by litigating consumer complaints against community hospitals. Walter Chiefitz, attorney for the Arizona Hospital Association, argued that community hospitals were being illegally organized as nonprofits because as he quipped, does anyone seriously argue that these bond sale promoters are in it for their health? He sued board members for incorporating nonprofit corporations with quote, the express purpose of evading the Arizona Security Act by claiming an exemption for the sale of securities. And he alleged that they had not been incorporated for charitable purposes, but, quote, for the personal, private, and pecuniary profit of its promoters. He represented bondholders who felt defrauded due to misleading statements and omissions of material facts and believed that community hospitals would, quote, place a burden on the sick when they could least afford it. These cases show how bondholders became representatives for the public interest because they had litigation rights, which volunteer workers did not. Now, Northwest Hospital went with Valley National Bank as their bondholder trustee. And before they negotiate a sale to Good Samaritan, now Banner Health Hospital, they were offered a 15-year mortgage in lieu of bankruptcy. But Maryville Hospital had union title as a trustee. So West Valley hardware store owner, Walter Grzynski, formed the Arizona Bondholders Committee to rally bondholders behind the Maryville Hospital board after union title began bankruptcy proceedings. He said, quote, we must see that the hospital is allowed to operate without pressure or adverse publicity. Forcing it to go through court proceedings now will mean a great loss to all investors, end quote. He went further to say that, quote, since union title and trust have no capital investment in the hospital, we as investors and not the trust officer should determine if the hospital should go into receivership or bankruptcy. Women's auxiliaries who work thousands of unwaged hours to provide labor that the hospital could not afford to pay they were not included in this discourse. While their efforts would prove to stave off bankruptcy from union title, local bondholders were the only parties with legal protections to challenge proprietary interests. Now, Maryville Hospital reoriented towards profitability under the administration of Preston Powell, a Navy veteran from rural Arizona. Um, his leadership led to heightened morale among hospital employees and women auxiliaries. But a Dallas couple, Dallas, Texas, sued, Amer sued Maryvale Hospital in federal court, alleging that they had been sold unregistered bonds based on, quote, untrue statements of material facts. And they doubted that the board of the Maryvale Hospital would be able to repay. In a shocking twist, they gained support from a former director who claimed that he had been, quote, duped and deceived by hospital promoters and sought more than $2 million in damages for his ridicule and humiliation. He claimed that hospital promoters had collectively engaged in fraudulent activities 
quote, through a number of corporations created in several states and entering into a series of agreements with themselves and pleaded ignorance due to his inability to access information on bond sales or construction schedules. Shortly after, Union Title filed suit in Arizona Superior Court to put the hospital into receivership in order to preserve its assets. During the lawsuit, Paul Powell had apocryphally argued that there is some parties or parties behind the scenes making every effort to gain control of this hospital. Ronald Wilpitz, the director of Marcus J. Lawrence Hospital in Yavapai County, he was appointed trustee by a federal judge the following year and his first course of action was to fire Powell. For women's auxiliaries, this proved to be the final straw. Their president, Anna Cohn, had become well-respected across Maryville for her dedication to volunteer work. And she had every reason to assume that this entreaty would be taken seriously by, by hospital administrators. She admitted that morale among volunteers had fallen to a low ebb when she sent written protests demanding to know what engineered the removal. In response, Wilpitz glibly replied, that would be hard to say, one might say diverse interests, doctors, shareholders, who knows, end quote. That was a quote in the newspaper. He argued that Powell had been an unable administrator and issued a statement which claimed that, quote, the dismissal was certainly not a reflection of Mr. Powell, but due to differences of judgment, which Wilpitz characterized as a business judgment of the trustee, end quote. So in this sense, while these two communities shouldn't be seen as mutually exclusive, bondholders superseded women's auxiliaries in voluntary healthcare. And I do argue this because what we see in the early 50s is women's auxiliaries being promoted to being chair people of hospitals, you know? But by the 1960s, with the advent of proprietary interests in nonprofit healthcare, women's auxiliaries as workers can't get a meeting with an administrator or with a trustee when an administrator has been fired. So in just 15 years, you see a really dramatic shift of power away from the women who are volunteering and working there to, in many ways, the men who are representing the financial interests uh, of the public. That being said, I do think we need to remember that these two groups are often interrelated, as we see with Peck and his family. His wife, his mother, they were members of the women's auxiliaries as well, and he was a, uh, an administrator on the board. So in this case, I think what we wind up seeing is the way that the labor of a class became significantly less important than their financial investment. That's what I have right now. But let me move to the conclusion, wrap this up. Maryville Hospital was reconstructed under chapter 10 of the Federal Bankruptcy Act as in 1965, once Medicare money arrived. And so the facility became productive enough to pay bondholders some of the interest owed. In July of 65, a federal judge approved a 2% payment to bondholders, followed by a 3% payment in November and a 5% payment in 1966. While the aggregate debt remained outstandingly high, the hospital had a net cash balance and began to reinvest in design upgrades. Receivership delivered Maryville Hospital cash reserves and a 25% increase in patient visions. So by 1967, Lutheran Hospitals and Homes Society of Fargo, North Dakota, an entity with more than 80 facilities across the nation, they sought to acquire Maryville Hospital after purchasing the similarly distressed Mesa Lutheran Hospital. Soon after that, the Sisters of Benedict from Ferdinand, Indiana, they also tried to purchase Maryville Hospital, but after a bidding war, Good Samaritan, now Banner Health, purchased Maryville Hospital for $5 million in 1968. So the sacrifices of women's auxiliaries, they kept Maryville Hospital running until it could finally become a financial success. In 1971, the Maricopa County Comprehensive Health Planning Council, the CHPC, found that relationships between local hospitals and their surrounding communities had really been altered because of the removal of women's auxiliaries from hospital operations. One report argued, quote, a hospital is a community facility held in trust for the public. How this is done without a free and open dialogue between the staff of the institution and the administration is beyond me. How this can be accomplished without open discussions with planning groups within the community is a singular concern. That the community is uninvolved is a betrayal of responsibility, end quote. To ensure systemic stability, patient expenses rose at Maryville Hospital after it was purchased by Good Samaritan. Some of this was due to inflation, but it was also a way to balance costs throughout the regional system. In 1973, 
the CHPC denied a request by Good Samaritan to raise rates at the hospital. However, Good Samaritan recently opened a hospital in Mesa with projected deficits of around 1.5 million, and they needed additional revenue to repay bond members. The CHPC argued that it was not fair to patients to raise rates at the Maryville Samaritan Hospital since it was already profitable as an independent facility, but in the end, as part of the corporate conglomerate, the corporate healthcare conglomerate, rates at Maryville Samaritan went up and the CHPC was excluded from future rate hike conversations. Women's auxiliaries, they continue to volunteer at community hospitals as people like Peggy Schaefer show, but their activities trended more towards social events and they were no longer reflected the influence which volunteers had previously held. Instead, bondholders and their interests became representatives of what the public good is in community healthcare and their profitability became the determinant for success. Thank you all. I appreciate your attention during this presentation. I hope that you found it interesting. If you have, I'm looking forward to any questions that you all may have for me. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony. That was that was fantastic. Um, well, we have a we have a few minutes uh, for questions um, for Dr. Pratcher. So, um, uh, if we have any questions. Um, Please post them in the chat. Um, I, I'll get I'll get things kicked off. I I, I guess I had a question um, about uh, how much this is this story that you're that you that you told us today is unique to the to the Phoenix metro area, or do we see similar trends playing out across other growing urban areas in, in the West or maybe other areas of the country? I think that this story is certainly it's a Phoenix story, but it's indicative of the development of, um, of healthcare across the country. One of the things that you see within urban history um, is this description of a meds and eds, a meds and eds uh, economic model. You see it in particular in Rust Belt City. So there's been a lot of literature on places like Pittsburgh um, in particular, looking at their uh, economic resurgence in the latter part, in the last part of the 20th century and how it's tied to healthcare development. So I think when we look at the Rust Belt in some ways um, as a foil to the Sun Belt, what we then wind up seeing is that policies, practices that emerge here in the 60s, they make their way up north during the 70s and 80s. And so you wind up having this longer sort of national discussion on the way of uh, that healthcare can drive economic development. But I do think that you find the origins of these policies and practices in the Phoenix area. This is the earliest I've seen uh, this specific type of investment. Okay, really interesting. Um, we, it looks like we don't have any questions yet, but maybe a few comments. Um, let me see, Linda Winokur said, uh, Dr. Pratcher has established a firm foundation to study hospital development in Arizona, did you know we have St. Luke's as well as their Women's Auxiliary Hospital uh, visitor records at uh, the AHS archives in Tempe? I did not know that, thank you. Can't wait to look at them. Uh, we have another comment from Christine Larson. I loved hearing uh, the power of women. I'm researching the same story of in the community in Buckeye. Uh, so please, please, if you have any questions, uh, please, please post them in, in the chat. Um, I, I guess I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of the, the collections that you, that you looked at. I was particularly interested about the one at the local historical society in, in Glendale, Arizona. Um, could you, could you talk a little bit about, about what's, what's there? Yeah. So Glendale, Arizona, it's a, it's an interesting historical society. And I think this is, I'm not totally sure what the relationship is between AHS and the, um, and the local societies, but I found that they're really great for doing community-based research in the sense that what you find there are the records of people who may not, how am I trying to say it? They, they matter locally. They matter at a neighborhood sort of level. Um, you'll find yearbooks there. You'll find um, records from some of the, the local clubs. I do want to say, yeah, there might be some women's clubs records there. Lots of old newspapers for sure. Um, but what you find are records left by the community institutions. They'll have uh, index files where they'll index by topic and you're able to see what goes on at this sort of grassroots level. And that, the reason I think this really matters though is when we are talking about um, 
about academic histories, it's often at 30,000 feet. And it's very difficult to do suburban history from that level. So much of what goes on in suburbs is granular and repetitive. But because of that, it allows you to look at the way that policies at a federal level are implemented at the hyper local level. So by going into these you know, community archives effectively with records that are just left by people who are almost you know, amateur historians, people who just care about preserving the stories in their neighborhood, um, what you wind up finding is the connection between the meta narrative and the individual experience. So I really do recommend um, people going and just seeing what's stored at their local community archive just to get a sense of the neighborhoods that they're living in. Who I, what I've found is a much greater sense of connection to the people around me and to the broader stories of this country by seeing these records in such a personal and intimate type of way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, looks like we have another comment from, from Linda. St. Luke's was the first hospital in Arizona and one of the first in the nation to be purchased by a nonprofit out of state corporation. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, maybe perhaps you could tell us a little bit about, um, I know you're revising your dissertation for to hopefully be published as a book and that, but I also noticed that you're working on a new project as well, which is, is pretty amazing that you're juggling two large projects like that. I wonder if you could maybe just give us a little, uh, little uh, information on, on those two projects. Yeah, so my dissertation was a study of Phoenix, it was a study of um, municipal annexation primarily, and looking at the way in which that specific urban policy helps the city grow. Um, it took a very circuitous route, but I got involved in a specific discourse surrounding settler colonialism. And so understanding the way that urban annexation can be used to dis dispossess communities of color of political sovereignty and the land that accompanies that. That story is in many ways near and dear to my heart, but after seeing the unrest last year, after the deaths of Dion Johnson and George Floyd, I really wanted to work on an African American history for Phoenix and really for the broader Southwest. Phoenix is, um, Arizona has a very under-researched, under-theorized African American experience. We have the largest Black population in the West outside of Texas and California which in some ways makes sense. But when you think of the fact that there are many other metropolitan communities, Albuquerque, Denver, Seattle, with similar, with longer in many ways, uh, black histories, um, what we have here is a whole bunch of people who's kind of showed up at once without necessarily having a way of determining where we're all coming out of. So I've spent the last year trying to go through and I'm calling it searching for my people, but really search to see where I can find African Americans um, represented in the Phoenix experience. It's been tough in the archives. There's not a lot available, but what I find interesting is that much of the work that I did for my dissertation prepared me for this project because when you really start sifting through, you realize that African Americans are everywhere. So case in point, um, in 1962, the Franklins, they were um, a couple from the Bay, an African-American couple from uh, the San Francisco area. Their husband was a, uh, he was a retired military man. Wife was, a, I believe, a real estate agent. They wind up purchasing a home, maybe about 500 feet from Maryvale Hospital. At this time, it's very interesting the way that they purchased it. So there was a dealer between them and the original homeowner. The original homeowner sold it to an out-of-state buyer who did not have or who had an anti-discrimination clause in his mortgage, while the in-state buyer did have a discrimination clause in his mortgage. So the Franklins were able to buy it because an out-of-state interest was able to help them basically evade racial restrictions. And they were one of the first black families to move into the Maryville area all the way back in 1962. And so when I think even of this project that I just shared with you all, you know, I wonder, what was the community that they were moving into like? What were their neighbors like? What were the community institutions like? And I think one of the things that we wind up seeing then is that African-Americans were always represented in these neighborhoods. There have always been one or two or three. But what's interesting is the way in which African-American communities wound up emerging and developing in places that proved to be often the most unstable in the Valley. 
So I'm still trying to dig through, excavate, and figure out what this story is. But I think that the work I've done thus far is putting me on a path to make both of these projects make sense at the same time. Thank you for sharing that. That sounds, that sounds fantastic. Um, I believe we have a question from uh, Dr. Colleen Byron. Uh, Colleen, you want to unmute and ask your question? I do, but of course, you you got me right when when I put something in my mouth. Um, I wanted to ask <laughs> carefully um, about your choice of Maryvale um, in your in your research, and I want to say first that 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 your presentation is really interesting, and particularly what you shared um, post presentation. Um, on your research agenda, just in general, um, is really fascinating. And I wish you all the, the luck in the world digging out things out of small community um, archives, because you're right, that's where you're going to get the particular that in this case, um, really um, will help you define or tell the story or tell a story of um, the African-American experience in the Phoenix metropolitan area, which that's a lot to do. Um, that is, that's a very, very ambitious um, research agenda. Um, but my, my primary question is, um, why did you decide to start your telescoping out in Maryvale. It's a fascinating community. It's been a fascinating community for forever, um, but I'd like to hear why it's fascinating to you as opposed to why it's fascinating to me. Absolutely. Um, a long, almost a lifetime ago at this point, but when I was in grad school, I was fortunate enough to get a meeting with uh, Dr. Phil Vandermeer over at ASU Tempe. And so I told him about my interest in doing an urban history of the valley. And I asked him how to approach such a topic, because as you said, it's so sprawling. I mean, there's really just so much to do. He said to me, well, you know, you just focus on a neighborhood. You find a neighborhood and you build it out that way. And so I, being a West, you know, a West Sider, um, I figured Maryville would be a good place for me to start. It was familiar enough. And um, it was close to where I was at. It was a place that I felt like I already had a modicum of understanding about. So I began um, at the Burton Bar Library in the Arizona room, just trying to dig up what I could. And really this project has, has spilled out from there. What I found was that Maryvale, I mean, Maryvale is where much of this post-war stuff begins. I know that the East Valley is much larger than the West Valley in this sense, but Maryvale is a sort of proof of concept that allows for the master plan communities that are all over Maricopa County, all over the state at this point, to really take off. So in my sense, Maryvale, by understanding it, we understand out of what much of central Arizona is coming out of. So I just decided to go to the source and build out from there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the question, uh, Colleen. And uh, we also have another question from uh, Lowell Perry. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, great presentation. Really enjoyed it. And um, part of this is, is really more of a, a comment. I wanted to uh, congratulate you on, on, on really trying to do a deep dive on the Black experience here in this state. And we're in the process of doing more of that here in Yuma uh, at the Colorado River State Historic Park. We're engaging in some oral histories and, and video histories and we'd love to um, pick your brain on it, maybe involve you in it. Um, I put my information in the chat in a, in a message to you. Um, you know, the folks were here before they were in Phoenix. So um, there's a lot of cool stuff that's going on. Um, and uh, what I'm learning as an African American who just uh, located here maybe four years ago, um, even though I don't see many people that look like me, I know that there used to be a lot more, and, and most of the historians on here know that basically the Buffalo Soldiers ran 
this part of the state for many years until um, our fair government uh, uh, decided to uh, uh, kind of push them out after they had done all the work that they had done. So again, uh, uh, great uh, uh, presentation and would love to connect with you about what we're doing here with uh, especially, you know, you, you hear about you, know, you hear about farming, but you never hear about black farmers and, and ranchers and all here, and that is part of this history. So, congratulations, man! Keep on keeping on. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. really yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, and unless there are any other questions, I think we're getting pretty close to to time. Um, so I'd like to, to thank Dr. Pratcher. Uh, that was a that was a fantastic talk, and and look forward to working with you more in 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 the future. And if there's anything we can do to help you at, at AHS, please please let us know. AHS has been a, you know one of the first supporters of my research um, and travel grants when I was working out of state. Uh, I mean, even this opportunity right now, just being able to put things together. Um, I don't want to get too personal, but Linda basically showed me how to use a a, a reading log. Linda and Rebecca. So, you know, I have a lot of love for AHS. Thank you all for the support over the years. Great, all right, Dr. Pratcher. Thank you so much for that presentation. This is the mother of three daughters. I was just delighted to see um, your, your notes on uh, how empowered women were early on. So thank you so much for that, sir. All righty, that brings us to the end of our meeting. Uh, couple final reminders. Our next member event is going to be uh, the week of February 14th, 2022, and that's our member appreciation week. You're going to get details on that. Um, in addition, I, this is breaking news. I literally just heard this within the past uh, hour. You can access the new summer journal um, of Arizona history. It is now on Project Muse, and I think um, Marilyn, she just dropped a link into the chat. So that's our latest issue, which is Monuments and Mor Memorials. It's one of our special issues, and we are just thrilled to share it with you. And it will be mailed within the next couple of weeks. You'll find it in your mailboxes. So with that, again, thank you all for coming. Thank you for being Arizona history heroes. We can't wait to see you in the museums, and take care. <laughs>